Amen. Thank you, Jeff, leading us in worship. Uh, we do welcome you today to Great Hills Baptist Church. Those of you that are online, we welcome you as well as those of you here uh, in the worship center. Um, we have had a, a pretty tough go of it the last few days. I know many in our church have had uh, COVID, and many of you are watching us online. And uh, we're uh, praying for you, too, are in the hospital. Trey McElfish, we're praying for you, as well as my son-in-law, Jeffrey, uh, is in the hospital as well. And we were taking care of him uh, late last night, uh, getting him in the hospital. But that's, that's what you do, right, as family, take care of one another and love one another. And so uh, we are a little bit weak in the body. Um, I am in, in a kind of a strange quarantine right now. I am, that's why I'm not out among you or be in the back. I am uh, preaching, then I'll go back out and disappear. I have had my uh, COVID vaccination. I've had both of them, the Pfizer and, uh, but just being in Jeffrey's presence, being in his house and helping out yesterday, I just wanted to take extra, extra precaution. And so, uh, man, I feel like I'm quarantined up here pretty good. I mean, there's nobody up here. It's a big, big house, big stage, you know. So uh, we do have some guests with us today, and I really want to recognize you. I hope you all are able to make it. I know Casey and Nastasha have overcome COVID recently from Peru, and they're back in America. Are y'all here in the church? God bless y'all. We welcome you today. Thank you for being here. It's awesome. Casey and Nastasha and Ezekiel had opportunity to have lunch with them yesterday. They are missionaries in Peru. They're some of our partners. We, as a church, uh, support them. Ashley and I in our ministry, we love them, support them in their ministry, and doing a great, great work. They shared some stories with me yesterday, some of the things God is doing supernaturally, really. It's just phenomenal. And so thank you. I loved our time together. Also, Patrick and Donna McAllister, are y'all here in the house? God bless y'all. Thank you. Let's welcome them. Patrick and Donna, so good to see you. Um, now, don't laugh when I tell you their main part of their mission is it's Maui. It's Hawaii. You say, oh, I wish I could be so blessed. Well, look, that is a, that is a great mission field. And I know Patrick and Donna do a lot of things, and they're on the state side or in this part of the United States now, but they are, uh, they have a wonderful ministry of encouragement and reaching people and helping connect uh, churches, Christians on the mainland over into the, uh, the islands there in Hawaii. And I'm so sorry I'm going to miss lunch with y'all today. I was so looking forward to that. Lupe's tortillas, it's just my favorite. And so eat, eat enough for me, Patrick. Eat, eat extra helping for me, but I would love to. In the midst of all this, Ashley and I are moving. We're physically moving our, in our apartment to our home in Liberty Hill. The movers come tomorrow. So <laughs> put a little COVID on top of that, put a little hospitalization on top of that. And you say, why would God do that to you, Brother Danny? You love the Lord, and you're a pastor. Can I just say this? God is good. God is faithful. God is good. Somebody said, he'll never put too much on you that you can't handle. That's actually not true. He'll put more on you than you can handle so that you'll be totally dependent upon him. You say, well, what about 1 Corinthians 10, 13? It says that he won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. And there really is a difference. So um, I do want to welcome you and thank you missionaries. Love y'all. Pastor Sasho was standing right here uh, just a few weeks ago. I have to uh, just brag on you, church family. We were hoping to give them $9,000. Y'all have given them $27,000 to build their church in Macedonia. Absolutely amazing. So thank you, Lord. Our God uh, is an awesome God. He does exceedingly abundantly above. And so I know you're praying for me, and I appreciate that. And I'm very, very grateful and ask you to turn in your Bibles. If you have a copy of God's Word, maybe on your tablet, uh, on your computer, your phone, Open it up to Acts chapter 16. I'll begin reading verses 25 through 40 in just a moment. This is an incredible passage of Scripture. It should take us through the, the remainder of the chapter, uh, verse 40, 25 through 40, but I only have time to go verse 31, and I think you'll understand why as I shared this message with you. What a phenomenal 
passage of Scripture. I've entitled the message, Jailhouse Rock. Now, those of you, any Elvis Presley fans? Does anybody still remember Elvis Presley? Okay. One of his most popular songs, uh, You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog and Jailhouse Rock. I mean, some of these songs I can still, no, I'm not going to break out in song. Don't worry, but I can still remember the lyrics. And I know Elvis Presley in 1957, when he recorded the song, he did not have Acts chapter 16 in mind. It's probably the furthest thing from his mind at the time in his life. But I'm telling you, and even some of the lyrics that I will quote in a minute really remind me of Acts chapter 16 as the jailhouse, the prison, uh, the place where they were incarcerated literally rocked. And those of you that know your Bibles, you've read this, that there was a tremor, there was an earthquake that shook the very foundation of the prison in which they were staying there in Philippi and released them. So that's the title of our message. Let me read the text, and what a, what a wonderful passage of Scripture. As I begin reading in verse 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Mm. Remember their context. They had been beaten severely. They had been placed in a damp dungeon in Philippi. they Hands were connected to the wall. Their feet were connected to the stocks. They had been beaten on their backs uh, in much agony, much pain. And yet in verse 25, they, the Bible says they were present tense praying and they were singing hymns to God in the midst uh, of, of all that they were encountering. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great Seismos is the Greek word. It's where we get the, the English word seismology, study of earthquakes. There was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. <laughs> and the keeper of the prison awakened from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, he drew his sword and he was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, megalophone. You hear the English words we get out of that, megalophone, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, the Philippian jailer did. He ran in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe, pistuo. Believe, trust, uh, wholeheartedly, implicitly, with everything you got. That's what that word means. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. March 11, 2021, the Southern Baptist Convention periodical SBC Life did a feature story uh, on a man by the name of Bruce Plummer. Like I said, just a couple of months ago, they ran this feature story on my friend. And as I read over that article, I just smiled, and, I just, and it just did my heart so much good to see my friend, Bruce Plummer, being featured in this story. Let me tell you his story. He is a Native American. He is an Indian through and through. And in his own words, his own testimony, he told me, he said, Brother Danny, I just got to tell you, before I became a Christian, I hated people like you. I hated the color of your skin. I hated everything about, and this is what he referred to us as, white people. I just did. 16 years of age, I began drinking. 21 years of age in Portland, Oregon, he said I was a bona fide alcoholic. How about that? 21 years of age. Not only was he an alcoholic, he said, but I was on, living on the streets in Portland, Oregon, I passed out under, on a tree, right underneath a tree. One, uh, one night, I woke up the next morning, and this is his story. This is his testimony, and he shared this with me in person. I've had him preach this message in the church that I served in Arkansas. And so to see him featured just a couple of months ago for the whole convention to read his story, I was just so incredibly proud of him. He said, I woke up, and I realized, much to my dismay, I had fallen asleep right across the street from a church of all places. And remember, I'm not very religious. He said, I, I practice some of my Native American Indian religion, but I hate white people and what all they represent. And I fall asleep and I wake up. And he said, I felt something, some voice, something I never heard before tell me, you need to go across the street. 
You need to walk across the street. So he watched as the people left the church. And right when there were hardly nobody left except the pastor, he said, I walked very timidly and shy, and I walked across the street, and I walked up to the pastor. And the pastor asked me a question, and here was the question. You could tell he was homeless, right? You could just tell by the way he looked. And the pastor said, can I do something? Can I do anything for you? And Bruce Plummer said, well, he said, yeah. He said, there's a, there's a lot of things you can, you can do for me. He says, but mainly I'm, I'm, just, I'm just really hungry. And the pastor said, well, let's go to lunch. Sure enough, pastor took him to lunch, and he said they talked for a couple of hours. And uh, Bruce said he just began to ask question after question. And then the pastor took him home. And uh, he said, here, go into our bathroom and take a shower. He took a shower. And as he was taking a shower, and Bruce Plummer will tell you to this day, the thing that homeless people want more than anything, more than even food, is a shower, is a hot shower. And he said as he was taking that shower, he, he, he began to call out to God. And, and his conversation went something like this. He said, he said, God, I believe in you. It's just Jesus I don't believe in. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in all of this. I don't believe it at all. And, and he says, but God, I'm, I'm calling out to you. If, if you're real, do something in my life to let me know that you're real and whatever that pastor was telling me is the truth. And then it happened. And this is what God did. He said, I tell you not, I tell you the truth. I stepped out of the shower. And Daniel, you could, you could appreciate this testimony with your background in alcohol. And others of you in here struggled, struggled with alcohol. He said, I stepped out of the, the shower. He said, and immediately my alcoholism was cured. He said, I did not have the shakes. I did not have the, uh, the after effects. I did not have a desire for it. He said, I'm telling you, I was supernaturally healed of alcoholism. That's what God did in his life. Well, sure enough, it didn't take long after that. He gives his life to Christ at age 21. Today, he's, goodness, I forgot how old um, Bruce Plummer is. Uh, but I think he's well in his 40s, maybe 50, maybe even listening to this message today. And so we were up in uh, Montana, and that's where he serves as a pastor. And we took a group of people up there to um, serve with him. We took about 50 people from our church on the reservation there in Montana. And Bruce Plummer is a child of God. He's a man of God. He's a pastor serving the church of God. I'm telling you, some people's conversions are just that dramatic, just like the Philippian jailer, just like Bruce Plummer, just like some of you. You've had that kind of, of really, I mean, dramatic, I mean, earth-shattering, light, I mean, revealing. You've had that kind of experience with Christ. And I just have to say, praise the Lord. That is phenomenal. And it it does all of our hearts so good to hear stories like that. When we sang the song, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone, you know that song, Jeff and Lori, uh, Chris Tomlin. And after we sang that song and uh, he was to speak in our church, he, he said an Indian word. He said, hokey hey, hokey hey. And I was like, I have no idea what hokey hey means. And you know what it means? I can now die in peace. That's what he said. After hearing that song, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone, reminded him of his salvation encounter with Christ. And he goes, you know what, I can, I can just die in peace now. He didn't die. He went ahead and, and preached and washed my feet, which is, I don't know if anybody ever done that for you. It's a very humbling thing, washed my feet on the, on the stage there at our church. So here we are in Acts chapter 16. Um, what I want to do is just look at a couple of things with you in the life of the jailer and the missionaries the first thing I want us to notice is just what a story. I mean, you, you just don't come across stories like this every day. And that's why my exclamation point there is just what a story. And it begins in verse 25 at midnight. Paul and Silas, uh, they're still awake after a brutal day. And I remember they had been sorely mistreated, stripped of their clothing. And I think, I don't know, even past the beating, I don't know, for some reason, that just the exposure, just the humiliation, you with me? I mean, just, you know, bearing your soul and your body before people and then being lashed and just beaten upon your back. And so their backs are, are bruised and, and bloodied. And then their ballo is the Greek word. And that is a, that's a strong word. It literally means to cast or to throw. And so they throw them 
into the jail. They attach them to the, to the walls, so their arms are attached to the wall. Their feet are placed in the stocks. And so, I mean, they are a mess. And there they are. And what do they do? Well, I don't know what you are going to do. I, I'm, I'm going to be mad, right? I'm going to be feeling sorry for myself. And I'm going to be blaming people and, and maybe even blaming God and not, not these guys. I mean, they had the spiritual wherewithal not to complain, not to get offended, not to get bitter, not to get angry, not curse God. They had the wherewithal to literally sing hymns of praise to God Ooh, and to pray. Let me show you something pretty cool in verse 25. If you'll look at the text, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, and hymnao is the Greek word. Isn't that interesting? Hymnao. What, what English word do you think we get out of that? Hymn. That's right. That's where we get this word, hymn. We sing hymns. Well, they were singing songs of praise and hymns of praise to God. And verse 25 says, and the prisoners were listening. And don't, don't miss that part because the prisoners, they're listening as Paul and Silas, they know how they've been treated. You know, I think the thing that is so attractive to a, to a jaded world, to a lost world, uh, toward Christianity, I, I think the thing that's so attractive to them is when you and I behave like Christians. When we don't get offended so easy. When we don't just look for retaliation or revenge. When we don't curse God when things don't go our way and blame God or blame everybody else. But if you can have the spiritual wherewithal just to say, God, I'm having a hard time here. I don't know really what's going on. I don't even know how, God, this is going to turn out. But God, you are great. And I praise your holy name. Look, when people in your office see that, or people at school watch you do that, or people in your neighborhood, when they watch you go through your trials and your trauma, your heartache, your dis disappointments, and they see you still have the wherewithal to praise God, look, that's some of you today. I mean, some of you today, like me, it'd probably be a little bit easier if you just didn't come today. You know what I'm saying? I I'm sure I could have written a note or a couple of texts and said, hey, I think I'm going to just check out today. I, I, church, you understand, you know, we're moving and we, we're not feeling really good and just all these things are going on. I'm telling you, I said, nope, Lord, no. It, it, I must go today. I must practice what I've been trying to preach for 11 years to Great Hills Baptist Church, that God is still good, God is worthy, no matter what. And so that's what they're doing. That's what the Paul and Silas... Are doing. Verse 26, the prisoners, <laughs> they're not the only ones listening. You know who else is listening? God's listening. God's watching. He's watching them. And God's about to intervene on their behalf. Watch this. And not on their behalf, but everybody in association with them is about to get blessed. Nastasha, your story yesterday about the lady. That um, I'm still thinking about that story. Phenomenal story. How antagonistic against God and not really fond of our missionaries in Peru, but uh, when God revealed himself to this lady, the first person she wanted to contact was Nastasha. And I, I love that. I've often said this, and I want to say it to us again as a church family, that everybody's going to think about God at some point in time in their life. And when they do... You want them to think about you. You want them to think about you because you've built a relationship with them, right? You've lived the Christian life out before them. You've shared the gospel with them. And so God hears them, and now God is about to, uh, to act. All the prisoners, they're free to leave when the earthquake hits Philippi. Sh I mean, just shakes the place. Chains are falling off. Prison doors are fleeing wide open, and yet these prisoners, they choose, they choose to stay in the prison. Now, think about that for a moment. Why do you think that? I, here's what I think. I think they are so amazed and impressed 
that whoever this God is that is rescuing these two missionaries, I just want to be where they are. <laughs> I just want to hang out with them because what they have in this prison is a whole lot better than what I have in freedom outside of this prison. And here's another thing that struck me as really strange. The jailer will run up to Paul and Silas. The jailer who is free will run to the people who are incarcerated and ask them how he can be free. That, that just, anybody, that strike anybody as kind of strange? He's free. He's running to them who are in prison asking them how he can be free. He's the same man, by the way, verse 27, who unceremoniously had cast or tossed them uh, into prison. But now things have changed uh, dramatically. So he assumes that all the prisoners have escaped, and he's beginning to take action. Uh, he's going to do what any good Roman soldier would do uh, if everybody in your custody has escaped, right? I'm, I'm sure the his boss, the Roman authorities, are, are really going to believe this whole earthquake story, right? No, they're not going to believe that at all. They're going to believe he was derelict in his duties. He fell asleep. Everybody escaped. So he takes this kind of graphic here for just a moment, if y'all bear with me, but this is what's happening. He takes his dagger, and he's about to pierce his throat. He, he's about to pierce his throat, or he's about to pierce his heart. And he takes the dagger... And Paul sees him. Paul looks through the shadows and he sees the silhouette of a large man with a broken heart about to end his life. And Paul shouts out, do yourself no harm. Don't do that. We are all here. We have not left you. It's okay. The God, and I just think Paul's probably preaching to him now. Look, look, you don't have to do that. There's a better way. Christ loves you, my friend. You don't have to take your life. You, you, you don't have to end it all. Look, just put the dagger down. Please place, place it on the ground. And we know that's exactly what, what happened. We are all here. <laughs> Chuck Swindoll and his, his take on this passage of Scripture, and, and I've I've quoted his book before. It's, it's a great little book on the Apostle Paul. He, he calls it the Apostle Paul a man of grace and grit. And Chuck Swindoll, if you know just how, he's pretty funny. He, he's writing the commentary on this, this passage of Scripture, and, and he says, I would not have cared for that jailer. I, he said, I would have run like a spotted ape. I would have just fled the place, got out of the jail. He said, but that is not what Paul did. Paul and Silas had the wherewithal to stay, to stay. So the last stanza in Jailhouse Rock, <laughs> I got that tune in my head. Oh, we need to sing something before I, before I break out of here. Henry, Henry tells Bugsy, he tells him, take advantage. We, we got to nix this place. Let's get out of here. And Bugsy says, no, it's too much fun. I'm going to stick around. And I know Elvis Presley's not thinking about Acts 16, but that's what happened. In the third stanza, the prisoners, instead of fleeing, they just, they, they had a party and they stayed, just like these guys. They, they stayed. And we get to read about it and get to see uh, the miraculous. Um, so that's what a, what a story. The next thing I want to share with you, and number two, is just what a Savior. I'm going to look at verses 29 through 31. The jailer, he got a lamp. He ran in. He's trembling before Paul and Silas. You see it? And these godly men, they don't retaliate. That's something that just, I uh, just am like, thank you, Lord, that there are people like that, that there are Christians who are that deep in their walk with you that he does not retaliate. He, Paul does not even rebuke the man for laying hands on him and throwing him in the prison. Paul is not interested in justice to the jailer. He's interested in salvation for his soul. And that's what he's interested in. And some of you have that power, and you know you have that power for justice and retribution and retaliation. 
And, and I would just submit to you, in those moments that you have the power to do that, you really will demonstrate who you are and whose you are by the actions that you take. Because if you're a person set on revenge and you're a person set on justice and you're going to get in full measure what you did to me, oh man, you think you offended me, watch this and I'm going to... Look, if, that's, if you're on the verge, on the edge of that, you are far from Christ. And you need to come close to Christ and have this kind of life, this kind of Holy Spirit-inspired way of living so that when you have your moment of revenge, look, you're going to have your moment. You're going to have your opportunity, whether it's against me, against the church, against somebody that's offended you, or against a, a neighbor, a colleague, somebody that you once respected, you feel offended. Look, and when you have that opportunity, what you do next really reveals uh, what is true about you. So he brings them out and he asks them a question. And it's interesting to me what he does not ask them. He does not say, how did you guys get such a positive attitude? Paul and Silas, how did y'all sing and pray to God in the midst of the persecution and the pain and the, and the heartache and the disappointment? He didn't ask them that. Nor did he say, tell me the secret to earthquakes coming and delivering you. How in the world does that happen? Or he didn't even ask, why did you guys not flee? But he asked the question that would answer all other questions. He asked the question, how do I get what you got? How do I get saved? You say, well, do we still use language like that? Do you think he's really asking Paul and Silas about salvation in the, in the, in the Christian sense of the word? You better believe it. You say, well, how do you know that? Look, they've been singing hymns all night. <laughs> I bet the jailer's going, oh, my word, if I hear one more song about God and about Jesus, oh, my word. And then the thing starts shaking, right? And they know something supernatural is happening. And, and, and so he goes to take his life. Paul says, don't do that. So he runs into Paul and he says, where do you get that power? How do you do that? Who lives in you? Is this Jesus? Is he all that he says he is? How can I be saved? That was his question. And Paul says, believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will, you will be saved. I love F.F. F. Bruce's quote here. He says, the jailer knew these prisoners could tell him, quote, watch this, the way to peace of mind, release from fear, and a sense of security. Isn't that good? One more time. The way to a peace of mind, a release from fear, and a sense of security. And I would say, isn't that the case for everybody? Everybody wants peace of mind, release from fear, a sense of salvation, a sense of security. And Paul says, here's the answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I also find it interesting what Paul did not say. <laughs> Paul did not say, you heathen, you, you need to apologize. You apologize to me. You mistreated me, you take care of me, and then, then maybe I'll tell you how to be saved. He didn't say that. He didn't say, well, you, here's what you need to do. On the next Sunday when we have church down by the riverside, I want you to come and you need to join our church. And, and, and why, uh, something else, while you're there, I want you to give some money. That's what you need to do. You need to give some money. You need to join the church. You need to get baptized. And let me think something else. Oh, you need to go, you need to go on a mountaintop and pray for four days. That's what, the, that's what the Indians did in Montana. They go to the mountaintop for four days seeking God and praying, God, have mercy on us. Or he surely didn't say you need to go pray towards Mecca five times a day. Here's all these things you got to do in order to go to heaven. Aren't you glad that Paul said, all you got to do, my friend, is believe. Believe in Christ. Christ alone for salvation and it's free. It's God's free gift to you. Some of you are like, yeah, but that, there's got to be more to it. Look. Belief is not, well, I believe it's 1148 on a Sunday, July the 18th. I believe uh, I'm going to go have lunch with my family here in a minute. I, I believe it's a good day. No, that's not this flippant, casual belief. Pistuo, Billy Graham put it like this. Billy Graham said, Pistuo is not, men <laughs> it's not mental assent. 
It's a commitment of your heart. Isn't that good? It's not, well, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I'm an American. I believe in Jesus. Everybody believes in Jesus. Look, you have that flippant, casual attitude. You'll be one of those, you'll appear before Jesus one day, and he'll say, I don't, I don't know you. Yeah, but, but I believe. Remember the text, Matthew said, I, I believe, and I, I even did things for you in your name. And, and Jesus is like, sorry, I, I, I don't know you. Look, the demons believe, James 2, 19, and they tremble. So it's more than just belief in the sense of, oh, I believe. It's a, and Billy Graham is right. It is a commitment, a surrendering of our hearts to Christ. Bishop John Taylor Smith, he was a chaplain in World War I. In fact, he was the queen's personal chaplain. He was in charge of training the chaplains before he put them out to war, World War I, right? And he met with a group of chaplains one day, and he said, let me ask you men a question. He said, these are dire times. I'm putting you out on the front lines with the soldiers. Look, they're the ones that are about. You've got to talk to them. And when they leave the foxhole and go fight, well, let me ask you a question, chaplain. What if one of those soldiers turns to you in great fear and great trouble of soul, and they were to ask you, chaplain, what must I do to be saved? Look, some people say, people don't ask that question anymore. Yes, they do. One, they asked that question in the foxhole, the places this guy's been in Afghanistan. He knows they asked those questions. And they asked these chaplains, what must I do to be saved? And the bishop said this, Bishop John Taylor Smith, he said, he said, yeah, he would interview them. And if the chaplain were to go, well, uh, I'd talk about the ordinances, and, and, and I'd talk, he'd say, fired, you're not, no. You see, you're not going to war. And if the next chaplain were to say, well, I, you know, I'd try to comfort them, and, and I'd just try to say, look, it's, it's going to be all right. You're going to come out of this. He said, fired, no. He says, here's what you do, friend, when they say, what must I do to be saved? You tell them, believe in Christ. Trust in the Lord. You're probably going to die out there, so get saved right here so they may take your body, but praise God, he'll take your soul. And when you die, you'll go to heaven. He said, now, now you're hired. You're hired. That, those are the chaplains that I want. By the way, those are the preachers that I want. <laughs> I don't need these feel-good, religious, philosophical, ideological pastors, preachers, 18 ways to improve my sex life. Mercy! I'm telling you, men of God, preach the Word of God, man. Give it to me strong. Give it to me right out of the Word of God, not this mamby-pamby religion that we're so intoxicated with and so infatuated with. Let's read the Bible. Let's read the Word of God. Let's see people's souls get saved and, and their marriages healed and their alcoholism jettisoned. And, and we can just say, well, praise God. Look what God did. Well, you can ask me later what I really think about it, and I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> That's what I really think about it. I've been telling you all a story. I've been saying, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm about to tell you the story. I watched this story last month at the Southern Baptist Convention. <laughs> Some of my preacher buddies, they, they're almost like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're a Southern Baptist and all y'all do is fight. And I'm sorry you had to go to that convention. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, oh, well, you, you know, and I'm like, no, I don't know. And God is doing a phenomenal work in the Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, people are being saved. Well, the media is not going to talk about that, right? 570 churches planted in North America in a pandemic. What other group is doing stuff like that? And so I'm sitting there with 21,000 other people watching this video. And I'm like, I've never seen anything quite like this. Before I tell you the story, remember this. The power of the gospel. The power to forgive. The power to forgive. And Paul and Silas, look, if they were bitter and angry at the jailer, they never would have shared the gospel with him. 
Look, if you are bitter and angry in your spirit, you're not going to hang out at Great Hills. You're not going to serve. You're not going to do great things for God. Look, that, that hurt and that bitterness, you, you either got to roll that on over to Jesus and get over it, or you're going to be suffering. So I'm watching this video, and I'm like, you got to be kidding. This, this, isn't, this couldn't have happened. Chris Carrier's 10 years old. He gets off the school bus in Florida. He's a typical American 10-year-old boy. He's going to go home. He's not going to do his homework. He's going to go outside and run and play all day, right? Well, the man stops him as he gets off the school bus. He says, hey, buddy, hey, some of your dad's uh, friends, I'm one of them, we're, gonna, we're throwing him a birthday party, and, uh, and, and I want you to help me. Could you, could you help me out, do some of the decorations? And, and Chris Carey, 10 years old, says, well, yeah, sure. And he gets in the RV with this guy. And Chris says, I'm 10 years old. I'm driving out of the city. I'm not thinking, what's, what's going on? David McAllister takes Chris Carrier in that RV. And he throws him on the ground. And he takes an ice pick and stabs him repeatedly in the chest. He didn't kill him, so he's got to finish the work. So he takes him to this place is infested with alligators in the Everglades. And he takes Chris, he puts him next to a tree, and, and, and he shoots him in the head. The bullet enters right here near the temple. In some miraculous way, it goes through without, without killing him. Six days later, Chris Carrier wakes up. He's in the hospital. Somebody, I don't know who found him, gets him to the hospital. His dad explained to him what happened. And Chris is, and this is all on the video of the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm saying, what in the world is this? And, and, and Chris is sharing his story. And he says, you know, I, I lived through that. And here's, here's my conclusion. <laughs> if God could spare my life through that, God can do anything, so he gives his life to Christ. Chris Carrier becomes a follower of Jesus. 22 years later, he gets a phone call from the police officer at the sheriff's department. And they say, uh, uh, Mr. Carrier, we have David McAllister in a nursing home. He's at the very end of his life. Would you, <laughs> would you like to meet him? And Chris Carrier has been walking with the Lord now 22 years, and he said, yes, I would. Um, so they arranged it, and Chris Carrier goes into the room with David McAllister, and David McAllister is very uh, decrepit, he's old, he's very near death's door. And Chris walks into the room, and, and he says, uh, sir, I'm the young boy that you tried to kill 22 years ago. David McCaster, he, he turn, turns his back towards him, you know, and doesn't want to acknowledge him. Each day that week, Chris Carrier would go to the nursing home and visit this guy. One day, David McCaster acknowledged Chris, and he says, he said, I'm sorry for what I did to you. And Chris said, look, sir, I, I just want you to know that I forgive you. But I've even got better news than that. If you would trust in Christ, he would forgive you, and you could leave this nursing home, and you can go and be with God in heaven. And i tell you the truth. Chris Carrier led that man in the sinner's prayer, and he gave his life to Christ. I'm watching this. I'm watching this. And then they turn out the screen. They... Phase out the screen, and Chris walks on stage, and the place goes crazy, right? And I just had a thought for a moment. I said, well, this is really Southern Baptist at our best because we're celebrating forgiveness. We're celebrating salvation, and, and Chris talked about it. And somebody interviewed him. They said, well, what was that like? He said, <laughs> he said what was it like? He said, only, only word I can say right now is, uh, you go and talk to the guy that tried to kill you. Let me just put it like this at first. I just want to say it was awkward. <laughs> it was just awkward. Wouldn't it be great 
to have a walk with God like that. Whew. To have the Paul and Silas wherewithal to, don't, don't do that. To have the Chris Carrier wherewithal to say, look, I forgive you. You can be forgiven by God. Some here today, I, you're listening to this, and the Holy Spirit, He really is working on you. He's talking to you. Maybe, you're, maybe you are online watching, and maybe you're in the sanctuary, and there's, there's, there's two divergent streams flowing here, and one of them is the, is, is the river of salvation, and, and, and some need to give their life to Christ. You need to believe, right? You believe, not mental assent, but believe with your heart, confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, Romans 10, 9, and become a follower of Christ today. You say, well, how, how can I know that I'm, I really am saved, that I am really going to heaven? Be, listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. You're not going to be perfect, but you're going to know there's a change in your heart. Where there used to be bitterness and resentment and retaliation, you, you'll notice that there's forgiveness and there's peace, and there's joy. And I would invite you today to give your life to Christ. Brother Danny, what must I do to be saved? I'm not going to tell you all those four or five. I'm just going to tell you one thing, believe. Right here, right now, believe. Others of you, I know Christians, and a message like this, it stirs your soul, and that's, that's why I'm preaching it, because the Bible is a soul-stirring book. For the life of me, I don't know why pastors don't want to preach it to you. I mean, this is an amazing, this is an amazing book. I mean, you got some stories. You got, you, it, this is a fascinating document, holy book. And when you read it and when you preach it and when you try to live it, God just does some supernatural things. So here's, here's what I'm praying. I'm praying God does some supernatural things. As you, as you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today here, July 18th, 2021, would you believe on Christ today and give your heart to the Lord? I know it's simple, but I also know it's incredibly profound. It's the most profound decision you will ever make. And, and trust me that you cannot have that kind of power to forgive, that kind of power to overcome resentment, retaliation, revenge. Th that is not in the human psyche. That is not in the human nature. We don't possess that power. But I'm telling you, God does. And when you yield your life to Him, the Holy Spirit of God will come in and change you. And some today, you, you've received the Holy Spirit. You've been born again. You, you know you're going to heaven, but man, you struggle. The struggle is real. The whole resentment thing is real. The, uh, the revenge mentality, the, not the reconciliation, but the retaliation that, that bubbles up strong within you, and I'm praying for you. I don't know, maybe it's just for you that I'm here today to share this message because it's going to change the absolute course of your life. The bitterness is gone. Look, whether that's you're here at Great Hills or whatever church God leads you to, please deal with that bitterness. Ask the Lord to cleanse you of that so that you can have a clear, clean conscience and that your walk with God is not interrupted with stones of stumbling and rocks of offense, that you are, you got smooth sailing, all right? <laughs> or smooth pathways. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I love it. I just, I just hope, God, you give me the opportunity to preach it till I die. And I just, I love your church, God. I love the big C church of Jesus Christ all over the planet. And especially love the local C church, Great Hills Baptist Church here in Austin, Texas. And we are praying, God, we're asking you to do a great work, a miracle in our hearts, Lord, in our lives. So what does that look like? What does that look like for you? Would you just pray with me? Somebody somewhere, I'm not sure where you are, but this is, this is for you. You can, I don't care if you pray it out loud. You, you can pray it quietly or silently. It's just a prayer of salvation, a prayer of, I'm, I'm just yielding my life to God for the very first time. Dear God in heaven, 
I know I am a sinner and I desperately need your forgiveness. My life is a mess. I am in bondage. And I believe that you, Jesus Christ, are the way and the truth and the life. So by faith, I trust you. I believe and I ask you to come into my life today. Right here. Right now. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Who among us prayed that prayer today? Maybe, maybe you're online and for the very first time you, you, you prayed this prayer and you, you meant it. And you, you felt something different. Man, we want you to let us know. Please, please type something in that description box. Or maybe you're right here in the sanctuary. Is anybody in here by uplifted hand? You just raise your hand and say, yes, pastor, for the very first time I prayed and I gave my life to Christ. Anybody? I can't see real good. I'm getting older and there's not a lot of light, but I don't see any hands. But maybe your hand's raised. And if I can't see you, forgive me. Just believe in my spirit that somebody, somebody got saved today. And I rejoice with you. I praise God. Oh, the rest of the story, my, my, my. You, you can go home and read it. You don't have to wait on me to preach it. But man, that Philippian jailer, whoo, son, he is fired up and ready. <laughs> His whole family gets saved. All of them get baptized. He serves them. He helps them. He's a changed, changed man. So we rejoice to hear your story. And we're grateful to God for you in Jesus' name.